So hello everyone and uh, thank you for being here. And this is my brief uh, introduction is why I've been talking about the subjects that I've been talking about, which on the surface perhaps don't, are not necessarily astrological in nature, but evolutionary astrology is about the soul. And uh, I came to the point in my life where I realized on this network here, there is a wealth of information about astrolog astrology, astrological concepts, principles, meanings, transits, interpretations, and that's pretty covered. And the directions my own life went in after many years of being a practicing EA astrologer uh, were I I came to levels of deeper integration of what this all means. What does it mean uh, to be healing, to be merging, integrating my sense of identity with my soul? And this is um, not that much, not that, Let's just say I, I hadn't found too much that spoke to me that really resonated deeply, that was that felt cutting edge, real, realistic, modern time, uh, speaking right to my heart and soul. And as I found myself unfolding in that path, I started speaking about it because I all the years that I was doing uh, evolutionary astrology counseling, I was trying to assist people in their unfolding. And, and uh, basically, to me, I found I'm finding what I would call the next level of in relation to where I had been before. And so that is what I speak about these days, which I look at it as it complements uh, the astrological information that is in, there's such a wealth of in these Zoom talks. I speak about, well, how do we apply this information? Uh, EA talks about North nodes and Pluto polarity points and the need to grow and change and surrender and release and let go and all that. And those are lovely concepts and how exactly does one do that? Um, most of us, most people that I speak with have feel a certain amount of questioning in that department. Uh, our conditioning, our existing spiritual paths and whatnot tend towards a lot more what we would use in the modern lingo, a lot more doing than being, and a lot more pushing and striving and obligation and, uh, you know, lack, in other words, on... <clears throat> I'm not really doing that great a job. I should be doing more. I'm sure these are familiar concepts to most of you, as most of us live with this. Um, so what I found, you know, we've also had 20, 30, 40 years of, of you know, supposed wonderful, you know, kind of instant cure sort of things where we're going to get a whole lot of growth and change. And that, in fact, occurs at, at times. But the issue to me, or what I experienced in my own life was, you know, to go to a workshop, perhaps an experience or a breakthrough, and it's like, wow, I'm really in the new now. And then 
lo and behold, not too much longer, you turn around and it's like, uh-oh, those same old patterns are coming up again. I must be backsliding, regressing, you know. This just proves how spiritually, <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, uncool I am because I can't seem to make this consistently work. So basically I started realizing these are not problems. This is the way it unfolds. It's, it's very natural uh, that there's what appears to be forward movement and appears to be the old coming back because this is part of the process of integrating the new realities, that, the new insights, the new perspectives that we experience. They need to be integrated and the old is no matter how much I may want it to all go away, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, we tend, I have noticed, we tend to judge ourselves and uh, not really show a lot of uh, gratitude or appreciation to the parts of ourselves that we don't like and don't want and wish would go away. So, um, I've been working with or learning, drinking in really, different perspectives uh, that so much of this is about perception. In other words, we can have, um, we can experience something that might be upsetting or to uh, triggering, meaning it sets off some old familiar wounded place in us. And I, I, lifelong, can have had a certain interpretation on what that means. Uh, I see it a certain way. I don't see it when I'm experiencing that. I don't see it that, oh, I'm having, most of the time, oh, I'm having a perception on something that happened. No, I'm seeing, you know, I really messed that up, and I'm feeling bad about myself as a result, that sort of thing but they become habitual patterns. And the, the interesting part is when I began to see that these are just ways of perceiving an experience. Somebody can experience, I don't have an example in my head at the moment, but something can happen. Let's say if I'm, I'm out on the street in a downtown somewhere and something is going on. And I'm experiencing what's going on there, and I'm having a certain perceptions about it, and I may be, they may be bringing up things in me, and I'm casting judgment on what I'm seeing. Somebody could be standing five feet away from me and be having an entirely different perception on the same experience. This is what I'm speaking about, that I can have an entirely different perception on an experience if I see a deeper level or another way of viewing it. And um, essentially, you know, I heard recently stated, which I thought was wonderful, um, we all have sort of maps. We've been given maps from our philosophies and our spirituality and our teachers and our parents and so forth. We've been given maps of the way things supposedly are. And then we judge ourselves in relation to how, what we're doing in relation to those maps. So the interesting thought that I heard was, uh, what if you have been doing nothing wrong at all, and the problem is not in you, the problem is the maps you've been given to work from to find out where you are. The maps are not accurate. And I think that summarizes very nicely what I'm speaking about. We have learned, we have been given maps or, or yardsticks is another way that I describe it, that one can never measure up against because the very map or yardstick contains within it a, like a subliminal assumption that I'm going to fall short. 
Well, the falling short is a judgment that I'm making. I've learned to make. What if I'm supposed to be in the grand cosmic scheme of things exactly where I am today, right now, this moment? Um, I may do something tomorrow. I may realize I could have done this. I could have done that. I should have done the other. But the gist of it is, I didn't know that today. So when I get this realization that I could have been doing something else, that comes tomorrow. Without the experience I had today, I would never have had the realization. So the realization, even though I might judge what I did, the shortcomings in it, that was exactly what I was intended to do. In a certain sense, it's even intended that I'm, to, that I'm going to feel bad about what I did, because that's also part of where I'm coming from. That is the conditioning that I have received, and what I am doing is learning to release that conditioning. Um, Thus, I can't really do anything wrong. I can say, well, I, if, I, if I were to do that again, I would do it differently. But that is very different than I was wrong because judging myself wrong brings in all the related emotions, guilt, shame, uh, even anger, you know, anger at being in this situation yet again victimization in the sense that, well, they said this to me and that made me feel the way I did. What if the way that I reacted is from my own wound and that person gave me the gift of acting in a way that brought up the next part of me that I, unconscious part of me that I am intended to become conscious of. And rather than beating myself, beating on myself about it, but to find the space to honor the part of me that is hurt or wounded or felt neglected or is having some childhood peace come up. And it simply wants to be held someplace <clears throat> from childhood or earlier in life that I did not get what I wanted, what I needed. And now, it's giving me the opportunity to give that to myself. I may have wanted it to come from someone else. If I didn't get it, that someone else was obviously incapable due to their own wounds from giving it to me. And so I can learn that I can nourish myself from within myself. Um, so in terms of I call this being true to self. And what I want to say with it is that the type of, I'm specifically talking on, on these topics um, because they're not, uh, the people that are drawn to listen to what I'm speaking about, it's because it speaks to some inner place inside that I find at this point in time, it's not so easy to find people that um, can resonate, can understand, can understand the places inside. Uh, anybody listening to these talks that resonates with what I'm talking about is started, starting with, you are not, you were not born to be doing uh, the things of what EA calls a consensus society is doing. This is not a judgment on the consensus society or the people that are doing those things. We are, we are each in the place that relates to or resonates with why we are here. The, the world, in my opinion, my perceptions, 
the, the whole planet is going through a massive up leveling of uh, picking up speed at this time. Very nature of what, what we perceive as reality is shifting. And those of us that resonate with this, we are feeling it deeply. It's, this is, I run into people all over the place and it's a common experience. It can feel like your life is falling apart. You don't know what direction you're supposed to go in. Um, it's, it's exp you know, expand on that. Any kind of sense of, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. What I used to do isn't working. Maybe it's, maybe what I used to do is disappearing from my life. People are disappearing from my life. I don't feel the same. I'm not sure what direction I'm going. These are actually, while it's confusing to the personality, these are actually signs of the transformation, the transition that we are in. And it's going to feel uncomfortable at times because we're reworking our relationship with our ego, our personality, because the soul is, the awareness of soul is rising. That's why I speak about this topic in astrology, because it's a soul astrology group. We are waking up. We are moving into very different perceptions about life. Uh, there aren't very, very many roadmaps, guidebooks at this point. There are people who get this and understand it, certainly. But we're, it's very new shift in consciousness. And those of us that feel this and resonate with what I'm talking about, we are part of that shift. And that's why we're here. It doesn't mean we should go live on top of a mountain. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't go live on top of a mountain. It, it, I mean, it doesn't mean that we should necessarily have to separate ourselves from what's going on. Although there may be periods of time and sometimes extended periods of time when that actually is appropriate, but it's not the goal. It's the shifting of awareness and consciousness inside ourselves, letting go of the old and the little ego. And you can look at that, the wounded child and so forth is very much an important part of what I'm talking about, personality, ego. Um, because it's been neglected and it's been neglected lifelong. And, we, and we've and we learned to neglect it because some of it is the parts of our stuff we don't want anybody to know about because we've gotten a lot of flack at the times that it, it has appeared. And it's the parts that we wish weren't there, but they are there. And they're actually very beautiful and loving parts of ourselves that have experienced a lot of pain and trauma. And part of healing and integrating is having the time and space to nurture those parts. This takes time. It takes focus. Most, in our, most of our cultures nowadays, you have to run, 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 run all the time. Uh, just to keep up with whatever, because that's just kind of the way things are now, it, at least in the you know, con conventional reality. And we can't totally divorce from that, but we can't be that either. And the attempts to be that don't work out, not because there's anything wrong with anyone, but because that's not what we're intended to be or do. Life purpose isn't, I've learned, life purpose isn't a vocation. It's not necessarily finding the ideal job or career. It's how I'm living the state of awareness that I'm coming from wherever I am and whatever I'm doing. If I'm, you know, an established spiritual healer and have a lot of clients and helping a lot of people, that's awesome. That's not really everyone's path. The world needs conscious people all over the place. It's the people, you know, it's the, 
can be the clerk at the uh, grocery store that seems somehow different than other people that seems to understand something. They're just quietly radiating. Maybe they feel silly that they even have that job. But sometimes I feel people are stationed in places that might not be of their personal choosing because life wants them there. They're needed, perhaps in ways that we don't understand, at least while we're in the midst of it. So what I'm speaking about in terms of being true to self, um, because basically we're, those of us that resonate with what I'm speaking about, we're a little bit ahead of the curve in this reality. That doesn't make us make anyone any better than anyone else. It's voluntary. We came here with a desire to want, because, you know, you look around, well, <laughs> we've had a lot of lives. It's not necessarily working <laughs> all that well some of the time. Um, and wanting to assist, wanting to bring more love and create less pain, and very innocently and caringly. And, uh, you know, the consensus, and we have our own wounds. We came, from, we came into families that are wounded because pretty much every family is wounded. And we're waking up out of that. And you could consider that whatever kind of wounds I've got in my family is actually part of my life purpose and mission. Um, because I'm going to know those wounds really well. And lots of other people have them. So as I'm healing out of those wounds, then I have some real wisdom that can assist other people that are perhaps a step or two behind, behind in terms of the waking up process and that are feeling insecure about it because they're stepping out of the known. This is what I mean by being true to self. Because um, there are people in our lives that support our waking up and our being true, but we're also going to encounter inevitably people, and perhaps a lot of them, who have skepticism, judgment, um, you know, scorn, for taking, for people taking unusual or out of the norm steps. Because it's scary to a person that's afraid to be who they are to see somebody who is trying to be who they are because it mirrors back to that person subconsciously what they're not doing. Um, and it makes them feel funny, awkward, or bad about themselves, and they don't want to feel that. We don't, most of us don't want to feel it either. But in realizing it's just part of waking up, so, sometimes I'm going to feel ways I don't like to feel. And through developing awareness of that and self-love and self-acceptance, I can handle feeling feelings that are uncomfortable. And a lot of people can't. They're not, they're not there. They haven't understood. They don't see the, the divine beauty and wholeness that resides at their core. And we're developing that awareness little by little. And people who have this awareness that I'm speaking of, we tend to be very sensitive because that's where you get the awareness from. Everybody is sensitive, but in a whole lot of people, it's shut down. People who are sensitive, people who are aware, past a certain point, are become unable to shut down, so they have to feel stuff. And in a world full of repression, when you're sensitive, and especially if you're empathically sensitive, you're feeling a whole lot of other people's repressed pain, anger, sadness, frustration, and so forth. So we have to feel a lot. I could rephrase that, because at a certain point it becomes we get to feel a lot. That's the transition I'm in from feeling like I have to feel it to feeling like it's actually an honor 
to be able to feel it. it may not be my favorite thing to feel, but it's a form of appreciation of being able to wake up and to help spread light around, to help others. And some of the people that are coming that are gonna give the most flack are actually people that are so hurting inside that can't take your light you're carrying and they throw back at you the way they feel about themselves, what's going on in them inside. Now we tend to take it personally, like, you know, what do you mean, you know, that person just called me a complete and utter idiot, you know? Where would that be coming from? Maybe I am a maybe I am an idiot. Maybe I'm only fooling myself and so forth. And I'm not saying that's wrong either. I'm saying that will come up. And part of it is realizing not everything I'm feeling is necessarily my feelings. Uh, so my point with the being true to self is our, our inner beacon, our uh, um, you know, searchlight, our direction is within us. We've learned to override it. Our culture has taught us to override what we know, uh, to doubt, intuition, insight. And part of this I find is step-by-step regaining trust in what we know. Because a lot of times what we know, what we're shown, is not going to make logical sense. It's not going to be logically received by a person that it may be about. Doesn't mean you know, I always am supposed to tell them about it, but getting information or awareness from a very deep source because we're simply doing this work of wanting to heal and serve. And because we're sensitive and because the, the, in general, a lot of the world doesn't understand this and throws back at us, you know, that's crazy, what's wrong with you, all of that. And that's what I mean by being true to self. Now, if you take that, it's my old pattern, um, when I started realizing that I was really hard on myself and I needed to become more nurturing and loving of myself. And when I found myself reverting to the old pattern of being really hard on myself, then I would then I would get down on myself because I had already decided that I needed to be more nurturing to myself and I wasn't doing that right now. So that's just a sneaky disguised form of the same pattern. Because the gist of it is we can't do it wrong. And a better way to say that is, I am doing it right. I am always doing it right. I may not understand how I'm doing it right, but I'm, I am always doing it right. And in coming back to that thought or your own version of that thought over and over and over, time and time again, when you find that you're in you know, an old pattern that's not supporting that over and over and over. I just noticed that over time and not, not, not that long a period of time, this starts reprogramming. I've seen it reprogramming my subconscious patterns. I've been hearing it described very, very nicely as um, the subconscious mind knows like two states. There's that which is known and familiar, and there's everything else. Now, anything that's not known and familiar feels threatening. And that's when the fight or flight response kicks in. That's when we get triggered. That's when the adrenals start pumping. 
So the interesting thing is if I have deeply ingrained subconscious patterns of feeling less than being upset with myself, being down on myself, thinking I'm hearing people criticizing me, that ironically is seen by my subconscious mind as familiar. The, and thus I take that in and float in that space. If I'm not used to feeling self-love and self-nurture, when I start bringing self-love and self-nurture into my life, it literally feels threatening to my subconscious mind. Sounds strange, but it's actually, I find it's accurate. Um, so the gist of it is what we're working to do over a period of time is reprogramming our subconscious so that nurturing, supportive, loving, self-loving feelings become more familiar to the subconscious. So it isn't rejecting them or being afraid of them. The gist of it is we've been doing the other, the traumatizing and the self-negating for so, so long. And it's not wrong and it's not bad and it's not a mistake and it's not something that I should never have gotten into. It was just inevitable. And now it's time or it's possible now to begin to change that. It's time, uh, to me, it's time on the planet for that to shift. It is shifting. The shift is already in place. And all of the very difficult and growing external manifestations that we're seeing uh, politically, uh, you know, in personal interactions, violence, polarity, and all that, I'm seeing more and more are not signs that things are falling apart, but signs that the old is breaking apart. And because that is unknown and unfamiliar, people are freaking out. Their nervous systems are freaking out and trying to hang on to things. And that brings up the old, you know, the racism and all the rest of it really is victimization. It's that somebody else is making me feel the way that I'm feeling, not me. It's not coming from me. I'm not at fault. So we will have parts in us who may not be racist, but we all have at this point in time, at least some places, um, I don't even like saying victimization because it sounds, it just sounds too harsh to me. We all have some places that we feel are happening to us, to us. And it goes to what I was speaking about before because it's about, it's about perception. It can appear that way. But when I realize that everything that occurs in my life when I deeply realize that everything that occurs in my life is occurring to help me evolve, to help me grow. It doesn't mean I'm gonna like everything that's occurring. Um, but the more that I internalize, integrate, not just as an intellectual mental concept, but actually experience occurring in life, everything that occurs, even things that are incredibly painful, unfair, seemingly unfair, and all that. There's some deeper place that is for my evolution. It is not bad karma. I am not being punished by life for my <laughs> sins and failings. Somehow, it is helping me. And I don't have to necessarily understand in the moment how, because I can't. Because the understanding of that comes uh, I can't understand how in the state of awareness that I'm currently in. Because if I could understand how now, I wouldn't be in the state of awareness I'm in. I'd be beyond that. So it's helping me open up and expand to even more of seeing 
Life is on my side very deeply. Um, so at this point, let me see. I would like to, I would like to start with Arden because I felt that um, what Arden wrote is a good um, segue, a good segue from what I've been speaking about into seeing how this comes up in individuals' lives. And um, Arden, I'll just summarize what she wrote. She's committed, she has, she has a lot of shoulds and she wants to free herself from them. She's heard these lifelong. She could not embrace being a follower, which um, in case it's unclear, I think is, is a very good, very good quality. Um, she says that she tried to be a follower. I, I'm, I'm taking from that to sort of fit in, whether it's following a teacher or following what one is, quote, supposed to do. Um, that led to a lot of isolation. I now see that was necessary so I can discover who I really am and nurture my true self. I've been confused what I should do with my life. I'm in transition. I have four goals and jobs, which feels overwhelming, but they all feel like destiny. I lack confidence. I see intense emotion below that, jealousy and shame, a lot of shame. Um, I want to reveal who I am into the world. And I just, you know, Arden, I, I found that very, what you wrote, very insightful. And um, I want to say that not all of us, in some ways, this is, I, I'm coming to see, in some ways, this whole thing is this life thing that we're in that we, this reality that we think we are in and understand. In some ways, it's like a, a, a really big movie. And it's a very interesting movie because it has like seven billion lead characters <laughs> who are each living out their individual movie, which is their evolution. And not, some of us are having a life that, has a lot of healing and quiet. It doesn't mean the entire life is going to be that way. But it, again, it doesn't mean it isn't. Um, and we live, in a, we live in a world and a culture that is very much about achievement, external achievement. Do, 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 uh, bigger house, more money. Um, if you're in the healing realm, you know, I got more people at my retreat than this one and that one. And fortunately, I know this exists. And um, this isn't bad or wrong. What I would say is it doesn't resonate with where what I feel called to. And I know that it doesn't resonate with what a lot of people feel called to. So ironically, I was speaking about being true to self. Being true to self can also mean that um, I know that at this point, I'm, I'm making a hypothetical statement here. I know that at this point in my life, that being true to myself is I'm supposed to be in a very quiet, almost inner sort of state because I'm integrating a lot. I am uh, bringing up, I am ha in that quiet, in that stillness that I allow myself. 
I am having old traumas and wounds surface. I am not rejecting them. I am accepting them. I am welcoming them in because ironically, uh, I know quite a bit about guilt and shame firsthand. And ironically, even guilt and shame are divine. We have been taught that they are the opposite, that uh, all these, we even taught in the spiritual path about negative emotions and positive emotions, and we sure don't want negative emotions. And so why is there a negative emotion? Why is someone hurt? Why is someone filled with shame? Where did the concept of shame even come from? Um, you know, the answer, I mean, I didn't have an answer to that. What just, what just appeared is shame is about when something is being pointed out that uh, maybe you could have done, even if it's helpful advice, uh, you know, you could have done this better. Whether the person intends it or just whether the speaker intends it or it happens in the psyche of the listener, it's, it shifts from being about an action or a behavior to being about the person. In other words, we're saying not, I could have been, I could have done an action more gracefully or more sensitively, but I am a defective person because I did that. That I think is the core of shame. And those parts of us very often come out of really early childhood. So when you think about it, if you had a two-year-old or a five-year-old and, um, you know, would you, obviously you would not be telling the five-year-old that they're a messed up person because whatever, they spilled something here or there or they were yelling when their mom wanted them to be quiet. But we, but we're not raised by people in many cases that we're aware enough to make that distinction. And even if the distinction was made in the mind of an adult, in the way the adult expressed it, it can be heard very differently to the child. So we have all these places within us that are these wounded little parts that just didn't get what they need. And this is part of what we're healing. Because in the quiet, in the space, in the time off, whether it's a month, two years, whatever, of, of quiet, of downtime, when nothing seems to be happening, or at least not what I would like to see happening externally, um, there's space there for feeling these parts in us and for changing our relationship to these parts in us. And I want to make the statement that I see in my belief or opinion more and more that my allowing the space and changing my relationship with myself and with those wounded parts of myself that I have tried to deny, uh, uh, you, know, lit, you know, verbally whip into, oh, you know, Come and talk to me and listen to them and allow them to cry and allow them to let me know what they need. Even asking, what do you need, five-year-old little girl? What do you need? Which is all maybe she's ever wanted. And that I see really clearly that sitting on a couch or in a chair or lying in a bed and creating space for that is adding to the healing of the entire planet. 
because that is what is not going on. And all of the crazy dysfunction that we see around us is from people who are wounded and traumatized from the experiences that they've had. And there's no space for those places to be held because there's not enough time. In a lot of cases, it's valid. There's not enough time. So life is, for some of us, life is causing us to have time. Um, you know, when a job ends, when, uh, I mean, involuntarily, when a, a living situation or relationship ends, I'm not saying it's easy. I have a different view of it. This is a graduation symbol. The value in our life for whatever is going away is, is gone because it represented certain lessons that I needed. That it's going away is a sign that I don't need that anymore. It means I got it. Now, the next chapter, the next act is, um, I'm in transition. In an ending, of course, we have a period, a transitional period, grief, uh, whatever, where we're integrating our emotions, our feelings about what has been. And this is really, really important. And in our culture, it's like, all right, I'm going to allow myself, you know, three months or two weeks or whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to be, then I'm going to make myself be over this because I need to get on. Really? What if, if the emotion is still there, the process isn't over? I don't mean you have to stay there 70 years, but we have no control over how long it takes to integrate. And the, the way I look at it, is when I'm when uh, you know I'm I'm in between a number of things at this point, and they're getting closer to ending, and I feel new coming, but I'm still in between. Now I find I used to be extremely uncomfortable being in between, and I found that's pretty common for people in general because it represents uncertainty. We don't know. We don't know what's going to go on. What's going on? Is my life falling apart? Is it ever going to come back together again? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's scary and feels insecure. And the gist of it is, I started learning to look back. I don't know if that's the best strategy or the highest strategy, but how many times have I been in transitional places when, you know, part of me was sure I was going to be dashed on the rocks and it all worked out and in ways I not the way I would have wanted or expected but it all worked out and I take it farther now it always does it always does it always does and it feels like in a movie if you've seen an adventure movie and yeah it's a little hairy there for a while and it can feel that way to us but in knowing that life is on my side, everything is for my growth. It helps. When the parts come up that are freaked out, instead of going, go away, scared part, it's like, oh, okay, so you're feeling really insecure. I get it. But I know the adult part. So I know it's going to be okay, and I'm going to take care of you. We're going to get through this, and we're going to be okay. In the gentlest possible terms. These are transitions. You know, I'm not Arden, what if? But because we're talking about EA, and we're talking about lifetimes and all this, what if a major part of your lifetime is about integrating and healing and that's what is intended and i'm not saying this is the way it's going to be for the rest of your life at all i'm not saying that at all 
But if a lot of it has been that way, what if it's on purpose? And what if it's not because you've done anything wrong or missed any callings or boats, but, it, but it's been a necessary part of your journey? And it could very well change. Because I'm, I'm pretty, you know, given what's going on in the external world, and I'm talking about the population growth and the ecological changes and the climate changes the and the limited re, the limitations of resources um, where a lot of changes are going to be going on on the earth and i feel like a lot of us are going to be called in the future in ways large and small that we don't know why or how um, to assist on all that we have gone through and continue going through is going to be of value to a lot of people who haven't necessarily been sitting around praying for growth and to be um, of service and all that but are going to find themselves in circumstances such as, you know, a million people in North Carolina and Virginia wondering if they're going to have a house next week. Um, this, I just feel like many of us are being, have been getting, being prepared for what's coming. And, uh, we can rest in that. We're getting late on time, so I want to switch over to Monique's chart. Let me get it up here. Um, and transits. There. So I see Monique has recently had a uh, nodal return, which is a big event. Um, Monique also just summer Monique clearly from what she wrote is a, a soul that came here to serve knowing that she's here to serve. And, um, you know, it, um, uh, working towards owning our own negative behavior and reflect and apologize. I, this is how I have interacted with the world. It's challenging for people. It makes me feel slightly lonely and off as if I spoke Japanese, despite that I have also seen miracles happening. And, you know, I say to that, um, those of us, we're, we're a few steps ahead. We're a few steps ahead. And so we're not, much of how we feel or see things is just not understood. It can't be understood. A good way, I used to say, um, that you can't teach trigonometry to third graders because they're not ready for it. I'm not saying the world is in the third grade, but we, we, are, we are, you know, often painfully aware of our shortcomings. And sometimes it's confusing thinking, well, if I'm the way I am, you know, surely other people <laughs> aren't quite that messed up. Um, but and it's not that they're messed up, but no, they're, they're not as self-aware is the way I would put it. And it's just the way that it is. It's, oh, it's a, better, a better metaphor would be 
if you're teaching a class, let's even, let's even make it a college class, try to make this more equal. So if you're teaching a college class and you're like a young college professor, you're in your late 20s and the people you're teaching are in their you know, early 20s, late teens. So there's not that much of an age difference between. And yet the teacher has insights or awareness that allow them to be a teacher that the students don't yet have. We don't expect the students to understand what we're teaching. If they did, they wouldn't need a teacher. Um, in the spiritual terms, a teacher isn't any better than uh, or more worthy than the student. They just are where they are. And so we're a few steps ahead of many, many people. And we come with consciousness and awareness and self-reflection. And a whole lot of people at this point in time, just they don't think that way. They've not been exposed to it. And um, so they're not going to understand. It, it's just how it is. And that's part of, see the gift in that in terms of the, the feelings of loneliness. The loneliness, I've, I have dealt, felt a lot of that in my life, but I'm beginning to realize ultimately everything for each one of us comes back to ourself, to our own inner path, to our soul, so to speak. And each of us, seven billion of us, has a completely unique past, and present and future and mission or purpose, unique. That's the infinite variety. So it's, we don't like the emotion of feeling lonely. I think it's sort of a human thing. Humans tend to be kind of social. But the question becomes to be true to oneself at what price are we, what are we willing to give up to not have feelings at times of lonely? In other words, if I'm compromising who I am, I have a lot of Libra. I, you know, I know a lot about this. If I'm giving up um, myself or parts of myself in order to keep the feeling of being alone, at bay, then I'm compromising myself, so I'm not really being true to myself. So the part that I'm supposed to be playing isn't really being expressed fully, as fully as it could, because there's no one else anywhere that can fill the role that's laid out for me. There's no one anywhere that can fill the role that's laid out for Monique. So the gist of it is, if, if I'm in a place where I am, uh, people aren't getting what I have to offer, what I'm saying, then maybe that's a, t a natural time when I'm supposed to be with myself. Because I also notice at certain times, people are literally, not, not dozens of them, but <laughs> at certain times, people are literally knocking at my door, calling me on the phone, uh, you know, wanting to talk to me. And at other times, this doesn't happen at all. So I can look at it like, um, I need to improve my website or advertise or something, or I can look at it like that's not what life is asking of me right now. And um, I can cultivate during those times, you know, what I, what I was speaking about before. I can cultivate being with myself, befriending myself, 
coming into deeper relationship with the parts of myself that I have pushed out, that I don't like. In, in the example you're giving, the, the, the lonely, for example. Okay, so there's a part of me that feels lonely. What do you need? This, the top level of that might be, um, well, I want to be around people. But maybe we can drill down below that because it's going to be, well, what is being around people going, going to give you? In a very, very gentle way, I'm talking about having this dialogue. In other words, there's something that I don't like to feel. I don't like the feeling of loneliness. I'll tell you, one of the things that, that I've been realizing, because um, even though I consider myself a, you know, a very spiritually oriented person, I'm also skeptical about a lot of the, I don't know, what I call foo-foo sort of trappings of spirituality. But in the last six months, I've really been recognizing all this stuff about guides and angels. I don't know if they're angels in the way that we think of angels with the wings and all this, but in other words, there are, we're, the realization that's come to me is we're never alone. We're never really alone, ever. I can say, come here. And I don't know how many people that I don't see come into the space because I just called them in. So, um, in other words, the alone time can be, uh, in other words, that's below the feeling. So if, I've, if I'm, what is it that I don't like about feeling lonely? And that's, there's no pat answer to that. There's a feeling there and there's something about that feeling I don't like. So what happens if I befriend that feeling and see where it goes? Okay, part of me that doesn't like lonely. What do you need? What is it that you're needing that you're feeling you don't have? Because maybe you can give it to yourself. So we, we're out of time, right, Linda? Yeah, that's right, Steve, yes. Okay. So we'll uh, pause for now. And if you want more of this, I'm back uh, some, around six weeks. I don't remember the exact date. But Excellent. Looking forward you, to that. Everyone. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> oh um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, that that's about it for now. I I welcome. We didn't. I didn't really leave time for questions or whatnot. But if anyone that's on the call has questions or comments or whatever, I welcome you to uh, you know send them to me. I'll write back to you if you want some some sort of answer. And uh, I think my email address is in the write up that's going up with this talk. So I appreciate all of you being on the call and I hope that you have found value in what uh, we've been discussing. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. Looking forward to You're seeing welcome. you next time in about six weeks. Would you all please thank Steve Wolfson. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. Great. Very well. Yeah, thank you very much. That was thank great. You. Thank you so much, Steve. You're such a loving human being. So um... you're very welcome.